Gotcha. All right. Hi. So I, heard you, I heard your introduction. Hello, Blenda. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Okay. Well, good, good, good. Blenda, where are you? Are you in Pine Bluff? Yes, I'm in Pine yes. Bluff, Arkansas. Yes. And I'm just too okay. excited for us to get started. Good, good, good. And then Desiree, I see you said in the chat, you don't have a microphone. Well, that's okay. I'll try to keep watching the chat so that I can make sure that I get your questions answered. Um, and then I do have to leave for another meeting. Okay, Shay. All righty. Um, so let's just get moving. And thank you, Shay. Okay, so today, like I said, we've got 31 registered, but I don't know if they all will be on, but we'll just keep on moving. So um, first, Carol in Lombard, Lombard, Illinois, she asked, grants for women who wish to become doulas. Well, first, I'll, if you're like me, I, I didn't know what a doula was to hear that expression. And so it's a woman or person who is employed to provide guidance and support to a pregnant woman before, during, and after labor. That's just a quick thing that I found. Now, uh, uh, what, now, when you first, let me say this, when you're going after grants, if you're using a word that someone may not understand, make sure that you put an explanation, whether it's in parentheses right after the word or whatever, the very first time that you mention it, because anytime when you're writing for any kind of funding and they're quest they have a, a question mark on whatever you're asking for, that's going to mark you down in your points. So just make sure that you include any explanation because you know the terms of your industry, but other people, the layperson may not. So yes, there are grants for doulas. Am I, I hope I'm saying it right. For one, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. They say here, let me move my menu. Uh, let's see, announces availability of new funding to support community-based doulas. Funding will expand the community-based doula workforce to help address maternal mortality. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services through the Health Resources and Services Administration announced the availability of $4.5 million for hiring, training, certifying, and compensating community-based doulas. Now, look at this, especially in the areas where high rates of adverse maternal and infant health um, uh, have health outcomes. Remember, all grant money, all grant money, no matter what kind of grant it is, is there to address a need. So in addition to this funding, they talk about also what's happening with Black women. And that says every maternal death is a tragedy. The fact that maternal deaths disproportionately happen to Black women is a national crisis. Uh, so at HRSA, we are committed to taking action. Our investment is growing the community-based doula workforce is an essential part of our strategy to better protect the health and well-being of women and address the crisis of black maternal mortality. So Carol, I'm not sure what your eth ethnicity, um, but whether white or black or Latino, just if you're focused on uh, populations that have higher mortality rates, there's even more funding for you, okay? Uh, let's see. Also, the American Hospital Association, they increase Healthy Start grants for doulas. And it says that, again, this is part of, a, I think that same, I think they're in collaboration here for that to be the, no, 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 it, it is different. 4.5 million, increase access to doula services. Now, these participants can get up to $180,000 each um, for supplemental funding, okay? And then you can just do a simple search like I've done here, grants comma doula. And that's just in a Google search and it'll bring up the different funders the same way I found them, okay? And you guys just stop me if you have questions as I go, even if it's not relating exactly to what I'm talking about. A lot of times you would just think of a question because of something I said. So feel free to stop me. Now, Angela in Alexander, Arkansas, she asked, are grants available for some home improvements? Well, yes, but a lot of times there's, there's, there's other stipulations. So let me just go through this and then I'll show you something. She says, we have a new property and would like to see if grants are available in the area. Well, Angela, if you're, are you on? If so, can you come on and talk to me? If not, see, without specifics, I don't know if you're looking for home for 
to do low income housing or transitional housing, or if you're talking about just your personal home. So either way, let me just show you something. In most cases, this is how you qualify when there's funding available for home repairs. If you're not doing transitional housing, if you're looking um, for just your your own personal use. It, stop it, stop it, you guys. Um, and so one, have an income no more than 60% of the HUD adjusted medium family income. So you have to qualify as a low income household, okay? Two, for rental projects with five or more assisted units, meaning assisted living, you must have a minimum of 20% of those units are for low income individuals that qualify under HUD. They can exceed 50% of the HUD adjusted medium family income. And it's very easy to find what HUD's incomes are. You can easily just do a search. You too, stop it. I'm sorry, my two dogs are wrestling right here. I hope they're not making too much noise. Hey, hey. And so, um, so yes, that's, that's for if you are offering assistance and then apply through your local or state government as HUD doesn't provide assistance directly to individuals. So again, you can just type in HUD comma housing and for your area, and then it'll bring up more information for you in reference to that. So like for instance, stop it. I'm sorry, you guys, go outside. And so um, like for instance, this says Arkansas, but this same link will provide you whatever state you're looking for, as you can see over where my mouse is, is circling, okay? And I will put this link in the chat. Uh-oh, let's see. And then you guys can, oh, well, you know what? I'm also going to include it in the session recap. So I'll do it that way. Okay, you guys, that way I won't have to come out each time. Okay, so they say here, mitigation savings and tax credits. Each eligible household may receive up to 15,000 for roof replacement through the Fortified Roof Grant or up to 7,000 towards Fortified Roof through the Fortified Construction Grant. So they're just showing you the different kinds of funding that's available when you come to this site, which here's more about that. Um, Arkansas Mitigation Assistance Resource Guide, it'll give you information there. So this site maybe uh, should provide some helpful information for you. And again, for anyone else that's not in Arkansas, you can select your state when you get to that site and I will provide that link. Here's another search that you can do, a simple search, grant, comma, home repairs. And you, as you can see here, it brought up different, different categories like um, the grants that for the, this is under the WVTM13.com. The grants provide up to $10,000 to home, homeowners who qualify, who qualify. OK, so you will, they will always provide the guidelines of what designates qualifications. OK, but use And so they're saying here here to qualify to upgrade single family residence residences to protect from wind damage by helping protect homes across Alabama. The goal of the program is to also lower home insurance. Then it, when you go further down, there's the same kind of funding available in Florida. See, when they're, because what they want, again, grants address a need and municipalities do not want their residents to leave and go somewhere else. So even when there are natural disasters, states are requesting funding to help homeowners in instances to help secure their homes better for those natural disasters. So you guys may also want to be looking at those, okay? Now, next, Teresa in Cleveland, Arkansas, and I have a lot of people coming on from Arkansas now. Um, I, I'm telling you, that station really has a reach. Um, question one, what are steps in getting nonprofit status through the state of Arkansas so that you can then get IR, your IRS 501c3 status or your tax exemption? Well, all, all anyone filing to be a, a tax exempt organization must also become a corporation. So you would just go to your secretary of state's office and develop your, your, uh, your articles of incorporation. And that part of the process is fairly simple, but you must make sure 
that you include the required language, like there's a dissolution clause that the IRS requires. And uh, so that because nonprofits cannot be developed where if you dissolve it for any reason, all of the assets cannot go to the board members and to the owner of the organization or the executive of the organization because you're getting free money, tax-free money that you don't have to pay back. And the IRS wants to ensure that people do not develop these organizations, get a whole lot of assets and then dissolve it and take that tax-free money. So if for instance, you've got a well running nonprofit organization and it dissolves, all of the assets must go to another nonprofit organization and it cannot be any conflicts of interest, okay? Um, so again, you guys, if you have any questions as I'm talking, just stop me. Let's see, is that all that she had? Teresa, that was your only question. Okay, Vicki in Salt Lake City, Utah. How to get a grant for building housing? Well, I'm, when you say that, I'm thinking you might be talking about for low income and transitional housing. And there's a lot of money for that when you are helping to create affordable housing for those that are less fortunate. So for instance, I did some really little research and this is for Utah and it's called the Salt Lake Neighborhood Home Grant. And it says if you are, now this is even for individuals, but if you are a U, Utah first time home buyer looking for a home in Salt Lake, a 39,000 neighborhood down payment assistance grant is available. Why? Because cities want to do things to help people come and stay in their area. See, what a lot of small towns don't do that all big cities do is constantly market and provide services that will help sustain their population. They do not want people to leave their, their municipalities. And so that's why there's tourism grants also, which I'm jumping to something else. That's why states are always showing commercials promoting their states because they want you to feel good about where you're living, but also they wanna promote other people to come to that area. And so this is just another way by offering grants to first time home buyers so that they can stay in that area. And again, there's stipulations. The, the OWN and Salt Lake City program is federally funded. Deferred loan, it's a deferred loan and grant program. This program assists eligible first time home buyers purchase single family homes, with a deferred loan slash grant up to 39,000. Now, the stipulations about the loan um, here, uh, what which will make you have to pay it back. Um, you must purchase within Salt Lake City boundaries. The actual grant amount will be determined on the funds needed to close determined by the loan applicant qualifies for. So they're looking at your income and your current situation to see do they give you the full amount or do you get a partial amount based off of the revenue that you have coming in, okay? Deferred loan funds should be repaid by the recipient in full if the homeowner sells, exchanges, or transfers title, refinances for any other reason than to lower interest rate or ceases to occupy the property as primary residence before the forgiveness term is satisfied, okay? so. It will be forgiven if you stay in the home based on the stipulations. But if you do any of these things, then you're expected to pay it back, okay? Purchase price cannot exceed 522,000 for the home. Must be a first time home buyer. Visual assessment must be completed. So they're going to have someone come and do a home inspection. Applicant must complete a home buyer education course and pre-purchasing counseling. Now. Usually when there are stipulations like that, they've gotten the grant and there are stipulations that they must adhere to as far as requiring the receivers of the grant in order for them to make sure that they have honored what they were supposed to do in order to get the grant to fund to others. Okay, I hope I was clear as far as that. And then must be below maximum income limit. So you can easily find that out by just going to your doing some research for your local HUD office and seeing what are the income limits for that qualify to get, you know, grants, okay? Vicki's question number two, did someone have a question? Okay, I thought I heard something. How to set up a philanthropy chair inside a for-profit? Well, I'm 
thinking that maybe you're talking about, can you have a for-profit and a non-profit? You guys, a, a non-profit cannot exist within a for-profit and vice versa. A for-profit cannot exist within a non-profit. It's just like you and your sister can live together, but you can't use each other's social security number. You can live together, you can share expenses, you can make it easier for both of you to do the things that you're needing to do, but you cannot, one cannot exist within the other because the IRS has to know who to tax and who not to tax, who's receiving grant funding, who's not, yada, 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 like that, okay? Um, let's see. And then we've got, come on, move my little menus. Okay, Melinda and Conway. Question one, how detailed does a financial statement need to be? Well, I'm assuming that you're talking about the, the budget, your budget, your budget detail must match whatever you've written in your narrative. So if you've got a really detailed narrative with a really complex program with seven, seven contractors and teachers going to be working with you within your, your organization, um, you've got all these this equipment and supplies that you are, are talking about you're going to be using. You're going to be taking field trips. You're also going to be bringing in speakers. So however, whatever all you're talking about in your narrative, there should be budget line items to go along with that. Even if someone is donating their time, you're showing that as an in-kind donation. So your financials are, the detail of it will, will, will determine will be determined based on how much detail and what you've written about and what your programs are going to be, okay? And then two, as a grant writer, when helping nonprofits who really don't have money but need assistance, how do you recommend for a grant writer? Well, let me say this. First, let me, let me jump to the for-profit arena. When people are getting a business plan written, because this happens often, people expect a grant writer to write and get paid later when the grant is received. Well, there's no guarantee that grant is going to be received and a grant writer should not guarantee you. The same way when someone is writing a business plan for a for-profit organization, when someone looks for a, a business plan writer, <laughs> they don't expect that person writing that business plan to guarantee that they're going to get an investor or a business loan. They also don't expect that business plan writer to get paid later. They pay that person to write that business plan at the time the plan is written. And a grant is a business plan. It is is just termed a grant because you're in the nonprofit arena. But so you do not, and, and grant funders do not like to see grant writers that will, let's say, say that they will write on contingency, meaning I'll write and then I'll write. And then when you get the grant, I get a portion of that grant. Most grant funders do not want to see that you're paying the grant writer out of that grant. They want that grant to be used for the programs and services that you're saying you want to offer. And so when, when a grant writer is paid, they're paid by that individual or organization as a contractor and should be paid at the time they perform the grant writing for that organization. Okay. Uh, let's see. Question three. When working with cities, is it best to form a coalition just to, to see how best to assist the city through funding? Now, I'm trying to understand this. Uh, Melinda, are you on? Because I'm not sure. Okay, are you wanting to collaborate with the city to help like, for instance, write grants for infrastructure, housing or whatever? Is that what you're saying? Because you can develop a relationship with your city like, I was a certified grant writer for the County of Los Angeles. And I did reviewing of grant proposals and that kind of thing. So is that what you mean? Or are you wanting to develop collaborations in your city in order to go after grants collectively? Because you can do that too. For instance, after the Rodney King riots um, with the African-American Unity Center and the Brotherhood Crusade and 55 other collaboratives, we after the Rodney King riots, we have a we had a huge collaborative of nonprofit organizations that could provide services to help with even the um, 
turmoil that took place during the riots. We had schools involved. We had gang intervention and prevention programs. We had health and wellness. We had a huge collaborative of organizations and we got over $2 million to support each component of the collaborative. So yes, collaboratives are always encouraged. You can collaborate collaborate within your city, just, just with two organizations that you want to work with or whatever. So that being said, I just don't know what else to say because I'm not real clear um, what direction you wanted that uh, for that question. So Christy in Conway, hi Christy. And Christy, uh, says, how are nonprofits set up to provide services globally? Well, I've developed several international organizations. You guys, I need to plug up my, I don't know if you can see that, it's saying I'm low on battery. Um, I've developed several global organizations. All of the ones that I developed, we established their corporation in the United States because the United States has more funders that are available than any other country that I've seen thus far. And so you want to be able to reach the, the, the funders that, um, those funders that I just spoke of. And so, but most funders want to fund to organizations that are established in the United States that can still do international projects. So that would be the first thing is to make sure, or at least, if the organization isn't already, I mean, is already established and they're in another country, then they would want to develop a, a strong collaborative with, the, with an organization that's here in the States in order to go after most of that funding that's available. Plus it's easier for a, a funder to fund locally to the United States um, because it also helps as far as with their paperwork and it's easier for tracking that kind of thing. But they're gonna want you to make sure that you have true blue relationships in other countries. Because we all hear about it that a lot of times in order for a, pro a program didn't get, get off the ground because some kind of city official was blocking it or people had to get paid first and that kind of thing. I mean, I was even told years ago with the We Are The World project that with all those singers coming together, there's a documentary out about it now, but it was Stevie Wonder and, and Michael Jackson and Cindy Lauper and Lionel Richie and all of these people, right? Came together, did the We Are The World project. Well, I was told years ago, because I work in this arena, that the food from that project sat on the tarmac and spoiled because the actual connections that should have been made were not made and, and it was like it was held hostage. So. Anyway, they wanna make sure that the programs and services that you are funding, that they are real, active, and that you have the relationships to make sure of that, okay? Next question two, can a 501c3 and a for-profit run under the same roof? Absolutely they can. And let me show you a perfect example of that. I, I developed an organization through, they're one of the top advertising firms in Hollywood and they're called BLT Communications. Let's see. So I'm gonna show them, show them to you here on the screen. Okay, so this is BLT Communications. And as you can see, they do the top movies. That was Barbie, The Hunger Games, The, the, the Last of Us. And when you just scroll down, Life and Beth, Scream, the Superman movies, um, Cruella. I mean, all of the most popular movies this organization does, uh, works with. And let me show you what they do. So, sorry, you guys, I'm trying to move my menus and stuff. Okay. They do a lot of movies, right? So let me go here, click on, let's see, key art about us. 
BLT is a 100% employee-owned creative agency founded in 1992 with long-term business relationships based on exceeding our clients' expectations. So what they do is they do the sizzle reels, the large billboards, websites, all the graphic stuff, all the promotional stuff for all of these big movies, right? And my first time going into their office, I was scared to death. Matter of fact, I was writing and I was talking to my board chair at the time, Lundy, and he says, are you there yet? And I'm like, no, Lundy, and I, I'm so nervous because I was going to meet with them and going to meet with their lawyer and also their CPA who was telling them that they could not have a nonprofit, that they're going to get in trouble with the IRS. And this, I'm telling you, this is this huge conglomerate. So when I walk in there and I see all of what they're doing and they've got all these huge posters all on the wall and I'm sitting there and I'm scared to death. And so Lundy calls me and he's like, okay, you're there there, right? And I'm like, yeah, and Lundy, I'm just so nervous and I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I was like, I, I was breaking out in a sweat. He said, stop, stop. And he said, they're paying you to come here, right? And I said, right. And he said, who pays for information that they already know? So just relax. And so that was one of the things that made me relax, right? Well, anyway, I get in there and I'm talking to them and showing them how they can become a non, have a nonprofit also. Living in their same building. And the thing is, you guys, is that what they had been doing, and this is why I knew they could do this, not only are they doing these sizzle reels for all of these huge movies and entertainers, but let me take you down here. See this BLT Helps? This is the nonprofit that I created and named it BLT Helps. Why? Because, okay, you saw their screen where you saw movie after movie after movie. Watch how they have their nonprofit set up and their page. And you're going to see the similarity already because they're doing the providing the exact same services exactly just to a different population because see, they were already doing this. They were doing graphic designs for schools, nonprofits, even out of the country and in indigenous countries. And even in India, as you can see here, because their founder, their executive director is from India and she knew the need there. So anyway, as I scroll down the same way, look, well, first let me read what you, it says here. BLT Helps is a unique nonprofit organization dedicated to providing graphic arts services to other nonprofit, charitable, and public service organizations in need. Whether local or abroad, the organizations we serve have different voices, but a common purpose to positively impact their communities. So see, again, they're doing the exact same service. And this is what I tell even so many small businesses. There are people that need your service that can't afford you under your for-profit. But if you have, know that you can serve people that normally can't afford you, you can develop a nonprofit and grants can cover your fees so that you can offer that exact same service to those populations. So this is what I explained to their CC, uh, to their uh, accountant and their, um, um, their lawyer. Anyway, we got their approval in 48 business days. The IRS didn't even frown on it because of the population that they're serving. So let me show you it says here, our work. So when you click on our work, it brings up all of who they are serving under BLT Helps. And if you look, the way that they're even displaying it is the exact same way they explained their movies, but now they're showing you instead of the movies, they're showing you the organizations. Unseen Shepherd, Last, last Minute Tour, uh, the Lotus Institute, Mind Elevation, Share, ne ne Share Necessities, Affairs Asia, the Women's Center. You know, they help with HEPA International. So there's HEPA there, HEPA in India. So they're, they're doing the exact same thing, but it has broadened their footprint to help even further make a difference in communities through their exact same services. So Christy, I hope that answered your question. And for all of you, yes, a for-profit and nonprofit can exist under the same umbrella. They can even share staff. And um, and that eases the burden on your for-profit because when that person is working on the nonprofit side of your business and under your foundation, they're paid by grants. So that eases the burden of you paying them and the dollars coming out of your for-profit side. Okay. I see something in chat. Let's see. Okay, Shane. 
can you get a grant to start a food truck business in Florida? Um, you can start a food truck business with a grant in any state. Now, if you're starting it just for a for-profit business, no. But let's say that you are you're 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 getting your food truck up and going, and you want to develop a culinary arts program that can operate out of that truck. So maybe you want to teach other adults or even young people how to become a chef. Now they can work with you in your food truck and create a, a, a program. Or let's say that you want to go to low-income areas, maybe in food deserts, and take your food truck there, like during the summer when youth are out of school and you're able to bring healthier meals to those youth. No matter how, you can be as creative as you want to be. I'm just giving you different examples of how you could get funding and it could fund your food truck and also be paying your salaries. So um, Renee, that's a, was that? Yeah, that was from, okay. So that answered your question, Renee? Yes, okay, great, great, great. All righty, so back over to my other questions. Let's see, you're welcome. Okay. And you guys, if, if if you're on and I don't see the chat right away, feel free to chime in, please. Don't let me miss your question. Okay, once. I'm sorry, uh, I have a guest that's been visiting and I had to stop and just speak for a moment. Okay, so next we have Phyllis. Okay, we have Phyllis in Fred Frederick, Maryland. And Phyllis says, are there grants available for those teaching financial literacy? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to show you how you can just do a quick uh, search again in Google, grant, comma, financial literacy, put quotes in front of and at the end of financial literacy. That way it locks those two words together. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then along with that question, how do you find the grants in our area and process the for applying? And then two, along with that, she says, uh, what's the maximum amount for grants and do you need to have an LLC? So there's no limit to the amount of grants that you can receive no matter what it is that you're doing. Your grant amount is based on how you've written your program design and what your needs are for your budget, meaning how many staff you're going to have, how many uh, participants are you going to be serving, how, how, how much supplies or materials do you need, what's the venue going to cost, are you bringing in speakers, are you traveling? I mean, all of the things that you say in your grant is what would dictate how much your grant is going to be. Now, even though I say there's no limit to the amount of grant money you can receive, let's say that you need $700,000 and you see a grant funder that their ceiling is 75,000. You can still go after that grant for the 75,000 as you continue to search other grant funders to, to make sure that you answer the requirement for your $700,000 budget. Okay, so again, here's a way that you can just do a simple search on Google. You can type in grant, comma, and see how I have financial literacy in quotes. That way it locks those words together. And it brings up different funders, financial sustainability initiative for nonprofits, grants for financial literacy programs, financial literacy and the education commission. Okay, so those are different ways that you can go after grants. If that didn't answer your question, let me know. Let's see. Sandy, um, in in let's see, Sandy, and I was just coming to you. So one of your questions, I want to build in the chat, she says, I want to build a home for women in need of short-term stay from leaving a facility to getting home to another facility. Like maybe I guess you're talking about getting out of prison or getting out of a substance abuse facility, I guess, is that what you're talking about? 
Would I need a for-profit or a non-profit? Well, if you're wanting to go after grants, most grants fund to a 501c3 organization, a tax-exempt nonprofit. But if you are not a nonprofit, for certain projects, you can go up under the umbrella of an organization which is called your fiscal sponsor or fiscal agent. But you guys, there are some funders when you're going after major dollars, like if you're going after 10,000, 50,000, maybe even 75,000, you can go up under a fiscal sponsor. Uh, it's like having a co-signer. You know, when you cannot buy a car yourself, maybe because of credit issues or whatever, you can get a co-signer to buy that car, right? Well, that's the same way that a fiscal sponsor, a nonprofit, you can serve under their umbrella and they can sponsor you to go after a grant. But if you're going after major grants like housing, a funder wants to see that you have your own 501c3. Using the same example like a, a, um, a someone that would co-sign, if you're going after your first time car, even second car, and it's a cheaper car, uh, dealers don't uh, understand getting a co-signer. But if you're trying to now buy a Bentley, they expect you to be buying that under your own name and having the ability to buy that in your own name. The same way in the nonprofit arena, if you're going after major grants, like for housing, you know, they expect you to get that under your own name and under your own tax exempt status. Okay, uh, let's see. So Desiree, I'll come to you in just a moment. Let me finish Sandy's questions here on the screen. Can I, so we need to get a 501c3 start there. Um, uh, yes, definitely. Okay. If you're, if you're okay. going to do housing, because those are going to be long-term projects and you're going to want your own 501c3. Okay. Um, and when then, you apply, we, go ahead. When you apply with 501c3, is that where you have to yeah, specify okay. nonprofit or for profit? Um, well, no, when you're applying for your 501c3, you're going to be a nonprofit. You're not specifying a for profit. You're applying to get your nonprofit status. Is that what you were asking? Hello? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. So um, let's see, where are you saying? In the presentation 51C3, were you saying those are different paths to choose from, do they go together? What did you mean by that, Sandy? This is, these are your questions, right? Yes, and so I, I was confused when I left, you know, the, the mm -hmm. theater. I had confused myself on what 501c3 was or what nonprofit was. I thought it was something separate, something different, but it sounds no, like they're it. the same. They're the same. Okay. A 501c3, okay, I see a not, well, let me take that back. You can be a nonprofit and not have your 501c3 status. See, once you develop your articles of incorporation saying you're a nonprofit, you are a nonprofit but you're just not tax exempt until you do the paperwork with the IRS to make you tax exempt. And that is what makes you a 501c3 nonprofit. Okay. 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 And then there are, there are 29 different kinds of nonprofits. What you're going to be, what most nonprofits are that are operating in community, they are a C3, but you could be a C8, like a chamber of commerce. You could be a C11 like a homeowner's association, you can be a C2, you know, I think it's an 18 that, I mean, there's so many different kinds, but the ones that are doing services within the community and going after grants, see all those others can't get, be, get funded by grants. Only the okay. 501c3 are the ones that grant funders are focusing on and providing grants for. So that's okay. why, again, like I said at the workshop, when people were getting upset, like if I said the PGA is a nonprofit, or NASA is a nonprofit, or they're a different kind of nonprofit that gets certain tax breaks. And NASA is doing all of this research uh, for the moon and, and space and all of that. So they're doing something that's helping humanity. So they're a different kind of nonprofit, but they can get government funding because of what they do. Okay. Then Sandy, you say, where do I apply to be a nonprofit? Well, you get your articles of incorporation from the from the state, and that's with anyone in the United States. Uh, you get your articles of incorporation done, and then you can go to irs.gov and you will see a form 1023. That's what you must complete to become a 501c3 tax exempt organization. Now, 
people have asked me a lot about the uh, the 1023 EZ form. I don't like the EZ form. I won't even work with a client to do the EZ form because most everyone that I know that came to me, they were going to lie on that form. See, there's certain things that you can't do. Like you can't make over $10,000, I think, in your first three years of operation. You can, there's, there's these stipulations that you can't do. And one of the one of the guys even said, "Well, Sharita, they won't know." And I'm, I'm, I said, "Already, you're starting out dishonestly." So, and what you're doing is setting yourself up for an audit. But the reason why people right. want to do that EZ form is not only because it's a simpler form, but it's cheaper. I think it's two hundred or two hundred and fifty dollars to do that one time form, where to do the IRS form ten twenty three long form is six hundred dollars. But I say go on and save and pay that six hundred dollars and not have any limitations yeah. versus trying to save and fill out that easy form. And now you're setting yourself up for an audit. Okay. Okay. So, um, and then question three, you said, what is the first step in setting up your, up your nonprofit? So that would be it doing the yes. form 23. Now for all of you, I do like, I'm in the middle of a master class right now. Uh, I've developed over 600 nonprofits operating globally. We just got another one approved. He got his approval in four business days through the IRS once we submitted it in the portal. So I have a master class where I teach, um, I, sh I walk you through developing your own nonprofit. If you guys are interested in that, I'll send you, in the recap, I'll send more information about that. Okay. So, so Sharita, is, yeah. there, uh, is, there, um, is there cost associated with getting your nonprofit status in Arkansas? Um, no, if you do it yourself, there's no cost. I mean, the, to do your articles, I think the articles are $35, I think. I forget. What form uh, is what form is that? Where do you where do you get that? That's the articles of incorporation. You just get that on at your Secretary of State's website. Okay. So and you can just type in like Secretary of State Arkansas or Secretary of State Florida or and go to their through their site and do your articles of incorporation. Now, for those of you that might be interested in my class, we do all of that in the master class. Your articles, your bylaws, developing your programs, editing and making sure your programs are designed, you know, um, um, with at, for approval, that kind of thing. So, um, when do you plan on doing another one of those classes? Well, we're in class three now, and it's a six-week class. So the uh, the next one won't be starting until like June. Okay. okay. Um, uh, possible, I mean, about the end of June, no, the middle of June, okay? Um, and I also have a, a grant writing masterclass, so. All righty, so now Desiree, was that it, Teresa? Yes. Okay, uh, Desiree, my friend is having an exciting, uh, let's see, exciting not-for-profit being given transferred over to her a pottery making setup to provide an art space for our community in mulberry arkansas um can grants pay salary to the employees and for the operation of the studio and if i'm on the board as vice president can i get paid for my time teaching classes first if you're going to be paid yes it can pay for studio it can cover salaries it can be total you know it can cover pottery materials, all of that. But if board members under a 501c3 are not to be paid. So uh, Desiree, if you're going to, if you're, you, you have to choose, are you going to be on the board and do your fiduciary responsibility as a volunteer or do you want to be paid and work within the organization? You should not do both because many grant funders frown on that because the board is supposed to be there to do their fiduciary responsibility non-biasedly. And it's hard to be non-biased if you're being paid, okay? And so, um, so I would recommend that you not be on the board or you're on the board until funding starts to come in, then you step off the board if you're getting ready to start to be paid and your, your position can be replaced, okay? Did that cover you? Let's see. Phyllis, let's see. Now, Phyllis, I've got some questions that I'm going to cover that you sent in. So I will come back to you. 
uh, Beverly, let's see, if you need 25,000 and you got one grant so far for 5,000, would you save that until you have enough other funding to do you need, a need to use it for the lesser service? How long do you give yourself to get the full amount? Well, it's great that you got that 5,000 toward a $25,000 project. Yes, you want to, you want to go in and start to use it if there's something you could be using it for now as you're going after funding to finish funding your project. But if you're not needing to use it now and that 25,000 you need in full to do something else within the program, then you save it. But is that was, it, was that an agreement with who gave you the dollars? Were they expecting you to use it right now for something based on what you wrote it for? Or do they mind you saving it as you go after the additional 20,000. So Beverly, um, that's where you have to come on and kind of give me more clarity as far as that. Okay, well, um, this is a, a hypothetical. I just wanted to know, like, if I, when I start, um, you know, reaching out, let's say, you know, I know I need $25,000 to do the project that I'm wanting to do, but I'm applying for different funder through different funders and some of them are $5,000, some of them might be $3,000. Should I go after the smaller numbers and try to pull it all together to get enough or should I um, not go after the smaller numbers because I might be, uh, they might require me to do something with it other than the big thing? That well, I go after everything that's possible mm -hmm. because like, you know, but let them know that your full project is 25,000. You always want to say that if you, especially if their limit is 5,000, mm -hmm. you want to let them know that you have read the guidelines and you can say per your guidelines, we are aware that your ceiling is $5,000. Mm -hmm. Our project is 25,000. We will continue to seek other funders to fund the full project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to let them know that you understand their ceiling. Okay. Also, again, if if you can use those dollars for something that's leading up to as you're getting the other dollars, then use them mm -hmm. as you're going after other funding. Okay. Okay. So how do I find out from them if there if there there's a requirement that I that I do some particular thing? Well, their guidelines will let you know. Okay. Because they may say that it's got to be used within a timeline line or whatever. Okay. And then uh, also there's usually a liaison that you can either email to or call mm -hmm. and ask them additional questions. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank All right. Uh, let's see. So that was Beverly. I'll come back to you, Phyllis. Uh, let's see. Uh, Felicia, when is your grant master class? Actually, the grant master class is starting at the end of May. And uh, we've been advertising that. So I'll, I'll give you information on that, Felicia. Yes, would you please? I'd appreciate that. Okay. And uh, now Tanya in Conway says, let's see, can you have a for-profit and non-profit in the same building? Yes, you can. And I think I've answered that clear enough. So uh, when Christy was asking it, Melissa, I don't know what this is, CHAS AFB. But Melissa, how do I go about finding a financial representative until I can apply for my, my 501c3? I think you're talking about a fiscal sponsor, a fiscal agent. And now you don't want to just ask any random organization the same way you wouldn't ask any random person to be your co-signer. So you want it to be an organization that you know and trust as far as their operations, as far as a nonprofit. But any nonprofit can serve as a fiscal sponsor. They do not have to be a nonprofit that's doing exactly what you do. For instance, you might have a, a, a collaboration that you're doing with the local automotive center and you're developing a, a, a teen uh, automotive training program, but you can go up under the umbrella of a 501c3 that's a women's empowerment program or something, okay? So they don't have to be in the same area of interest for them to serve as your fiscal sponsor. Next, what is the best way to solicit in-kind and local donations from your community? Now, for those of you that may not know what in-kind is, that's anything given to you, whether it's uh, volunteer time, equipment, um, a venue, anything that's given to you that is 
not actual cash. That's an in-kind donation. And so what is the best way to solicit? Well, first, being known in your community and people knowing what you do, that's one of the things that solidifies you getting an in-kind contribution because people would like to be involved, but oftentimes even Walmart and uh, Walmart, for instance, gave one of my clients in Compton, we got 200 backpacks donated full of school supplies. Um, and that was an in-kind donation that with all of what they gave, that was worth over almost $15,000 in what they did. Um, it, because they also gave cash with, along with that. But so in-kind comes from people knowing what you do. They want to be involved and they may have something that they can give to you versus giving you actual dollars. Okay. But uh, it's most of it is just being known for what you do, getting your, um, get uh, building out your brand and people seeing successes in what you're doing. Okay. Uh, there seem to be several ways a nonprofit can classify themselves. Can you explain the difference? Example, public charities. Well, again, public charities fall up under the 501c3 category. If you are a private foundation, like even when you're filing your paperwork with the IRS, it asks, it, it, they're classifying you based on what you say and you're answering the question that you're going to be a public charitable. The other option is a private foundation. Private foundations are those organizations that are giving the dollars, not doing programs and services. So you would be a public charity, be a charity and you would be a, that would classify you as a 501c3. Renee in Palmetto, Florida says, how to get started. I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, I don't know if you're talking about for grants, for nonprofit status. So I'm hoping that the questions I've answered already, Renee, help you. If, if yes, they do. I just I'll wait for to... your I'll wait for your master class information. I'm excited. Thank you. Good, good, good. Great, great, great. And then Desiree, Mulberry, Arkansas. Where do I start? Well, Desiree, I hope I've answered that question because I'm not sure what else. And Desiree, you're on. So if you want to type something or if I've answered already, can I apply for more than one type of grant, say for property and business? Nothing prevents you from submitting 20 different kinds of grants if you want to. Like think of a YMCA. They're going after grants for youth basketball. Another, They're going after another funding for their aquatics program. Uh, and that's for their senior, uh, they call it their twinges and hinges program. But then they're going after another grant to teach toddlers swimming. That's their, what they call their, um, their tadpole program. Then they're going after grants for youth camping. And they're going after grants for teaching knitting and crocheting as an after-school program. And they're going after a grant for their after-school tutoring program. So see, there's nothing that stops you from going after multiple grants for the multiple projects that you have, okay? I hope that answered it. Three, if I don't have money, how can I pay for classes? Well, what kind of classes? Um, because for instance, there are grants for women and higher education. There are even grants for women that are over 35, if you're in that category. There are grants if you're a minority. There's a, there are grants if you're going to law school. So there's different kinds of grants. Let's see. What does this say? Desiree, let's see, existing. I don't know what you mean by that, Desiree. Felicia, when is your grant writing master? Okay, I'll let you know about that. Desiree, yes, ma'am. Thank you. So excited. Okay, good. And then, okay. Ah, I thought I had some questions for you, did Miss Phyllis. Oh, you had registered, but you hadn't submitted questions. So let me come back to your question, Phyllis. Phyllis, good day, Sharita. As I build my literacy program, I serve as a fitness specialist for seniors part-time and I need money grants for this. That will help in literacy and fitness. What's your suggestions? Well, let me just come out of this. And then you guys were at the end. So if you have any other questions and if you're on, just come on and ask me. But let me go over here, Phyllis, and show you how you can just find whatever you're looking for. So Phyllis, if we type in fitness, seniors, uh -oh, and grants, 
Age Well Foundation, nonprofit grants for fitness, grants for seniors in Arkansas, grant focus, funding uh, funds for older adult wellness programs. So it's unlimited what you can go after. But in addition, Phyllis, you can type, you can go after grants for your literacy program too. Grants comma literacy, and it brings up a whole nother pot of money. The Lucy Project, grants and funding, 76 literacy and library grants for Arkansas, adult literacy grant program. So the funding is there, my dear. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else? Just chime in. <laughs> this is Beverly. Hi, Beverly. <laughs> um, I just, I, you know, some of the folks were asking, like, how do I start and that type of thing? Um, I just want to be able to just put it out there. I come back on to the um, these uh, monthly meetups because I just, I took, I've taken her class, both of them, the grant writing and the um, and the um, nonprofit class. So I just find that it where to start is that's a good place to start because the way that Sharita does it, she just takes away all, a lot of the time wasters that you might have if you try to just try to navigate the whole thing on your own. And she's just very generous. You can see from the way she does these things here, how generous she is with information. That's just how she is in the class. So, yep, I just want to let folks know just in case they'll have, I'm a very good, uh, what do you call that? Test person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Beverly, for that. And thank you for, for regularly participating here because you always give such great input and your questions also help others. And, and again, this is what I've even told my clients. This is another reason why I do this. Instead of you having to pay the $150 just to have one-on-ones with me, I always recommend people get on these free Q&As because there's questions that you wouldn't think to ask. And see, I'm triggered by other questions. And so you gain more by being on in a group setting versus when you're one-on-one. -on -one. And then later after now, you're ready to formulate more um, um, comprehensive th you know, thinking in what you're doing and your questions get a little more technical. Then that's when the one-on-ones and the personal attention can help you. Okay, anyone else? Did I get everything that was in the chat? Okay. Sharita. Yes. Is there a difference between um, if you filed like a normal, like for an incorporation or an LLC? Well, in order to be a 501c3, even if you're an LLC, you're going to, you're going to need to change it to a regular C Corp. If that's, and then you can file for your 501c3 status. Okay. Is that what you were asking? Yes, I just didn't know if you were like an LLC, if you could go that route to a nonprofit, but you do have to become incorporated no matter what. Uh, yes. Now, you may even want to keep your 501. No, 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 don't start, Ali. Don't start. You may even want to keep your, like I always suggest have a, a for-profit and a nonprofit, whether it is a established entity like an LLC or you're just doing being a sole proprietor and have done your DBA doing business as. And then that way, okay. sometimes you might want to do something that is just you on your own and away from your nonprofit. And so you can do that and get paid as a consultant, for instance, if that's what you want to do. But you also have your 501c3 staff. See, when you have both, there's no doors that are shut to you. You've got an answer to whatever way they need you to be. And so, and okay. that's why, like, if you're not, doing a whole lot as a C Corp, then avoid that extra taxation and just be a regular sole proprietor, not be taxed every year as a C Corp because you also have your nonprofit. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Now, what I'll do, you guys, is I will send this recap. It will also have the links for some of the research that I've done. It will show some of the search categories that I used. And um, I will provide also the links to my pages to talk about the grant writing masterclass and the nonprofit class. Um, and now we just had someone that just jumped in on this nonprofit class, but she jumped in when we got into class two. And she was this class is every Thursday night for six weeks. So she was there last night for her second class. 
it's too late, I would say, for anyone to jump in on this class. We've gone too far. Uh, so I would say wait until the next class and I will provide that information for you. Now, for those that understand paperwork and you feel comfortable, you know, it's it's not a requirement to work under someone like me and go after your tax exempt status. I just kind of, with my class, we just have had greater success with IRS not bouncing back and forth and having a whole lot of questions and delaying you. So are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I'll ask one more. Well, hello, Sandy. And then I'll come to you, Teresa. Okay. okay. Since you guided me toward 501c3 with yes. nonprofit to get started for something brand new. But um, so then you mentioned about C Corp, DBA, something else. So I'm not sure which way I need to go with that now. Okay. Now, if you're going to be a nonprofit, you would need to form a corporation and those articles, those approved articles will have to go along with the form 1023. But okay. some people already have an LLC and they'd like to keep that for-profit side because okay. it's doing something else. Okay. So, and, but like I was saying, but like, let's say for you, Sandy, you, um, you don't have an entity, you don't have an LLC or S corp or anything. You can still be a sole, uh, you know, uh, as a sole proprietor, let's say that you have been doing some consulting or something and you can still develop your nonprofit. But if you want to do some operations, like for instance, a few years ago, when I went and spoke at Chicago State University, I went as Sharita Herring. Now they knew about my organization, but I wanted to be able to use those dollars for what I wanted to use it for and not put it into the company and use it there in the company. So because I had that choice and that was a lump sum of some things that I wanted to do that some take care of some things I wanted to do personally, I went as Sharita Herring and not the Philanthropy Alliance Foundation. And so when I did my W-9 for, or, or my, um, what form is it? I think it's the W, I did it as Sharita Herring with my social security number versus the Philanthropy Alliance Foundation and using the EIN number. So that's why I'm saying, you guys, when you have those options, it just, you don't feel tied down in any way. Okay. Um, Teresa? Yeah, that the way you just phrased that answer just almost answered my question, I'm pretty sure. So you would keep your, you could, you could just be a sole proprietorship as a DBA. Mm -hmm. And then for your nonprofit side, you could name it, you know, such and such foundation. And then get your nonprofit on that and and that i think you just explained what i was asking before yes. i even ask it so yeah. yes yes you can yes you can like just like for instance me here with my land what i'm going yes. to do over at my building that i'm going to build for my house i have to take care of that with sharita herring and sharita herring's income but everything else yes. that i'm doing on the land the clearing putting in water lines over here whatever else is going to happen on the cabin that I'm in right now, but it's going to be for the campers. And like when I have youth here, this is going to be the counselor's cabin. So that income coming in will be for the foundation and it's going to take care of all of that. That's why if you're running your organizations effectively, your salaries don't have to be what you think they need to be because most everything that I'm doing here is for the nonprofit. Is for the organization, even the animals and the feed and the more fencing, because I'm creating a petting zoo, an open air petting zoo environment for the youth that are going to come here and for the campers that come here. So, so that's why I'm saying a lot of what you think you would need to spend on yourself and that you need as a salary doesn't have to be depending on how you're structuring. And you learn more about the structuring. Nothing is learned overnight. But once you delve into it, you'll start learning more about the structuring and what goes here and what goes there. It's just like if you and your sister are moving in a house together, you can say, okay, we're going to split the bills, but you can't think of all the other things that may come up until you're in it. And then you say, oh, you know what? I forgot about the lawn service. Oh, you know what? We didn't even think about that. We're, we didn't even think about that. We're going to need Wi-Fi and internet and that didn't come. In. So you start learning other things as you're going. Okay. Well, all righty. Well, I want to thank all of you for being on. And um, if there are no other questions, I will see you next time. Remember, and please share.
every first Friday, I'm here. People should sign up and please get your questions in as soon as can, I can, as you can, so that I'm not last minute trying to answer questions because everyone enrolled last night or this morning. So again, thank you guys for being on and um, have an absolutely phenomenal day. Joy Lyons, thank you for being on this. I think this is your first time on my first Friday. Thank you, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, thank you. thank you. Oh, and please check to see if Dr. Lyons got my info about him being on the show on the okay. 15th. I did didn't tell him to text spam if he didn't get it. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Any Thank other questions? So what was that, Ivy? I mean, Desiree? That was probably me. Oh. <laughs> No, I was saying uh, thank, uh, thank you okay. and everybody have a good weekend. Oh, one more thing. I just want to chime in since your class is coming up soon and might be starting before the next um, um, meeting like this. The, the group format is extra. It, it adds an extra layer of information because then you're, you're getting examples from different people and what they're doing and people are encouraging each other and using each other for examples. That's, a, that's another excellent reason why a group, the group class is excellent. That's all I have to say. I can't help myself. I just. <laughs> well, no, thank you. Thank, thank you. And that's why I keep it small. Also, I will not let my master classes go over 10 people. I keep it small so that everyone can get personalized attention. And I can make sure that when you leave that your documents are specific to your goals and objectives. Okay. That's how it turns out. Thank you again. Bye. <laughs> thank you. You guys have a good one. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Have a good, you good month, everybody. Thank you. Bye.